working with someone on a project, and you want to make sure everyone's on the same page. So you document it for that reason. You also document it because oftentimes you are developing the website for someone. Now, I don't know like who we could, the Four Seasons, we could be documenting for the Tourist Bureau of Ohio or something like that. We focus on how beautiful Ohio is during the fall and how, um, you know, how nice the lake is during the summer and so on and so forth. So a lot of times there are other what, what are sometimes called stakeholders. In other words, people for whom the website's important, like the people that you're developing for. And you want to show them what your thoughts are because they're liable to be, have some input on how the site should look and, and what content should be on the site. So for a lot of reasons, it's a good idea to sketch it out in advance. All right? Uh, and we'll talk about this a lot more when we get around to talking about the semester project. But I want to build this in right from the start. And here's, here's sort of the sketch that I came up with uh, in my head. All right? Um, Four Seasons in Ohio. All right. Then I'm going to have the navigation. Spring, summer, winter, fall. All right. Then I'm going to have... Um, this is going to be my page about fall. So, and again, we're going to have a separate page for each one of these things. We have my page about fall. Where I'm going to have a paragraph that talks about fall in Ohio. Then I'm going to have a list of, you know, favorite fall things. So you could document that so maybe someone else could find up a better word for favorite fall things, but we're going to stick with favorite fall things. And then we could have a list, maybe a bulleted list of some of the best things about fall. And then we're going to have, we'll continue this on another sheet of paper, fall holidays, and then we can have Halloween and Thanksgiving. Now certainly one of the things that we would want to do with fall, if, if our goal is to show how beautiful fall is in Ohio, um, we would want a picture. And, and let's say we'll put the picture here. And it might, probably will be bigger than that. I kind of forgot about the picture until now. But we'll, we'll sketch it in like that. So at least we have an idea of what we're going to have. Now the exact words that we're going to write, maybe someone else is going to do that. Maybe our job as a web developer is just to create the HTML. Maybe there'll be someone else who's responsible for writing the exact words. So we may use Greek text, which is those sort of Latin paragraphs that we looked at in the early example to sort of fill in some of the spots here. All right? But let's go and build this page. All right? First of all, this is going to be our header. This is going to be our navigation. We could do this next part several different ways. I'm going to make this a section. And I'm going to make this an article. and this an article. Then the one thing I did forget is a footer, and we'll have a footer that will contain things like the credits, like where we got the image from, and stuff like that. And we could also put like an email address there, like to say for more information, contact, whatever. All right? Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to first build the HTML for this, and then we're going to add the image, and then we're going to worry about styling the page. All right, we talked about uh, CSS and, and style sheets. So we're going to go and we're going to 
add a little bit of style to this page. All right, so let me go and I'm going to open up Notepad++. And we might as well start with the tags that are going to appear on every single page, right? You could almost have like a template that you could just copy. That way you don't have to save you a little bit of typing. First thing that we have, if you recall, is a doc type at the top of each page. And doc type HTML indicates that this is HTML5. We have our HTML tag. And one thing I do when I'm coding is as soon as I put the start tag, I put the end tag. So I don't like type everything in and then go back and close the tags. It's so easy to forget closing the tags if you do it that way. Now, what happens if you forget to close the tags? It depends. All right? If you break the rules of the language, nothing could happen. Your page might work exactly as you intended, or there's a problem with the page and it won't display. And I think we showed an example of I forgot to close the title tag and my entire page was, was blank because it didn't know what to make of the rest of the page. It thought the whole page was a title and therefore didn't display, display anything. On the other hand, if I forget another tag, the page is liable to display just fine. You never know. But your safest bet is to follow the rules of the language. So. As soon as I type in a start tag, I'm going to go in and type in the end tag. I'm going to indent this so that at a glance I can see the structure of the page. I'm going to give a descriptive title so that people know what my site and what my page is about. And that's my basic tags. These are going to be on every single page. Now, there's other tags that are going to be on pretty much every single page. Maybe not as, as, as uh, widespread as these, but I have my header. I have my nav. I said in this case I'm going to have a section and this part definitely could vary. I could have a section, I could have articles, whatever. And then I'm going to have a footer. Especially with this middle part here. You're liable to come up with a different organization and don't Sweat it. Don't worry about it. There's not like one single right answer for doing this. The header, the nav, the footer, you know, usually pretty consistent. But that middle portion here is going to be different for each thing. So, the header, I'm going to put an H1 that says Ohio's Four Seasons. My nav, navigation is, can think of as a list of web pages. Um, I would make it typically an unordered list because you could really do the, the list in, in a several different orders, right? You, you could put, you could go spring, summer, fall, winter. You could do winter, spring, summer, fall. You know, there's no absolute right order to put them in, all right? So because of that, because there's no definitive order to put them in, I'm going to make it an unordered list because I chose this order. Now, I'm going to create the links for these pages and I might make one or two of these other pages, but I'm going to focus on the fall one. All right, but I'm going to make the links anyhow. 
So I'm going to say this one is spring.html. And I'm just going to copy this for the other three seasons. Now you might wonder, I'm including a link to fall, even though this is a page for fall. I think that's a good idea. I think it's a good idea to keep your navigation consistent. And so you have a link to a page that you're currently on. It's not that big a deal. Um, you can, through styling, make it clear that you're on that page so that people know that you're on that page. And we might talk about that today. If not, we'll talk about that in a future class. All right, so there we go. We're going to grab an image in a minute here. I'm going to deviate a little bit from my plan. I'm going to put fall, the word fall up here. And then I'm going to put an article. And here I'm going to grab Greek text, which all Greek text is, is just placeholder text. It's a filler text. Designers have, done, have used this for ages, even before there was a web, when they used print, you know, when you were designing what a book would look like. You know, you might not have the actual words yet in the book. The author may still be working on them. Um, but you wanted to get the layout down, so you would use Greek text. It's been industry standard since the 1500s. So I'm going to go and I'm going to copy this text. I'm going to put it in here. Now again, remember our formatting doesn't matter. We can have all this in one line, or we can put new lines in it so that's more readable. Um, the browser is going to display any white space, any blank spaces or carriage returns. It's going to uh, display those as single lines. All right, I'm going to have another article. That says, favorite things about fall. What are some of our favorite things about fall? I like nice weather to sleep. What else do we like about fall? Football. Football. What else do we like about fall? Sweaters. Sweaters, all right. Sweater weather. What else? Leaves changing colors. All right.
Anything else? Well, if we had any Starbucks employees in here, pumpkin spice everything. All right. And, oh, I forgot the articles about fall holidays. Halloween and Thanksgiving. All right, so I have essentially duplicated what I had laid out. I made a couple adjustments. I think I've moved a few things around or whatever, but I basically implemented this. So it's good to think this through. Again, I didn't spend hours agonizing over every little detail, but I thought it through and I thought about how I wanted it organized. All right, then I went and did it. Now if I deviate from that a little bit, if when I'm entering in, the, when I'm actually coding the page, if I come up with a better idea, that's okay. Remember, this is a plan. All right, a plan is what you intend on doing. If you come up with a better idea, that's fine. It's, a, it's okay to deviate from the plan. It's like I might plan to go on Cleveland on I-90, but if I hear on the radio that there is uh, construction on I-90, I might change my plan and go on 480, right? That's okay. It's better to have a plan than just, well, I'm going to head east on some road, all right, and then hope I end up in, in Cleveland eventually. All right, so let's go and save this. So I'll go up here and say File, Save. This being Notepad++, I can pick the kind of file I want to save it as. And I want to save it as an HTML file. And so I'll call it fall.html. And I'll go and save it on the desktop. All right. There it is. I can double click it and open it. And there's our page. All right. This should all be review of the first, what, well, we're in week four now. This should be review of the first two and a half or so weeks. Because uh, we haven't put any style on it, and we have not put any images on it. But this is the basic structure of a web page. And it's, it's structured, it's, it's organized in a logical way. It has all the main sections, and we can go from here and, and build on it. All right, um, next thing we want to do is we want to add an, an image to this, all right? Because if you think about it, it's one thing to say, oh, the leaves changing colors is a beautiful thing about Ohio, right? Well, if you never experienced that, you know, you might not know exactly what that looks like. So, you know, the old saying is a picture's worth a thousand words. So, we're going to go and we're going to add an image that will show what it looks like with the, with the leaves changing colors. All right? We're doing that not just for decoration. We're doing that because that's a meaningful part of the content. Right? If we want to show off, we're the Tourist Bureau of Ohio and we want to show off how beautiful Ohio is in the fall, you know, words can only take us so far. All right? An image will really get the message across. So I'm going to go out and Google
all in Ohio leaves. And what I'm going to do, by the way, is I'm going to go to a, a photo site called Flickr. I was going to Google it, but I changed my mind. All right, we're going to go to Flickr. Flickr is a photo sharing site. Now, can we just go off and use anything from these people's photos? No. If we were developing a site, if we were really the tourist bureau and we were developing a site, we'd be subject to copyright law. We're still subject to copyright law, but because we're in a classroom environment, the copyright law is less restrictive. It's like quoting something for a term paper. We can use it, but we have to give credit to the source of this. All right? Now, there's other choices that we could have for getting pictures. Right? We could go and actually take the pictures ourselves. All right? We may have pictures that we took last fall. All right? And since we took them, we own the copyright of them. So there wouldn't be any copyright restrictions there. We could hire a photographer to go, you know, maybe not right now, but in a few weeks to go and take a picture of, of the fall foliage that we could have. We could go to a stock photo. A stock photo uh, site is where, you know, professional photographers sell their photos. I'm going to go to Flickr, though, because we're going to look for pages, or I'm sorry, images that are licensed under Creative Commons licensing. Is anyone familiar with the term Creative Commons? It's a, it's a different way to copyright something. Uh, if you, you know, as soon as you take a picture, it's copyrighted. And it doesn't matter if you post it on the internet or what. It's still copyrighted and it's subject to copyright law. But with Creative Commons, you put it out there and you say, yeah, I know I have the copyright on this, but I'm going to let people use it. Now, why would you do that? Well, you might be trying to promote your photography business, so you let people use images for free, hoping that they'll come back and buy images from you later, or people will see your work, and, and it'll increase your reputation. You might do it, you might license, uh, allow nonprofit organizations to do it so, as sort of a charitable contribution. You can put some restrictions on as to who can use it. You might let people use it, but not change it. You might let people use it, but can change it as well. So they could take the fall foliage and put Godzilla in the middle of, of the, the forest or whatever, all right, uh, through photo editing. So I'm going to go to Flickr, and I'm going to search for fall foliage. I'm going to put Ohio in there. Now here's a bunch of pictures. I'm going to actually click advanced search. Ah. It's, it's, it's tough when you only use these these sites like once a few times a year. Any license I could say, I want anything that has a Creative Commons license or no known copyright restrictions or commercial use and modifications allowed. In other words, even if I was a business, if it was licensed with this license, I'd be able to use it. Or whatever. I'm going to search for this, which is a very unrestrictive license. And I have that picture. I'm going to click on it. And I'm going to click the download. And I'm going to download the original size. Put it on the desktop. I'm going to change the name to Fall, just so that it's easier to type in. Now I'm going to go and copy this, so I can put it in my credit. I could actually make that a link, which is better still than just being plain text.
and I'm going to say licensed under Creative Commons. All right. So I'm going to go and I'm going to put the image in here. Since I saved it in the same folder, I saved it in the desktop, I only need to put in um, the file name. And I saved it as fall.jpg. Remember, there's three types of files that you can use as images. There's at least three. There's probably a couple more as well under HTML5. But the main image formats are .jpegs, .gifs, and .png. Sometimes JPEGs have a .jpeg extension. Sometimes they have a .jpe. That's why it's important to have file extensions turned on on your computer so you can see the precise name of the file, including the extension. JPGs and PNGs are best for photographs. GIFs are best used for line drawings, for drawings. Like, for example, logos, where it's not really a photograph, but maybe it's just your company's logo or insignia, like the LCCC insignia or the Pepsi insignia or something like that. GIFs also allow for um, layers which allow you to do some, some simple animations in, in GIFs. All right. It's not that you can't have a photograph in a GIF or you can't have a line drawing in a JPEG or PNG. Um, it's just that the formats are well suited for that. And what do I mean by well suited for that? Images use what's called compression to get the file size down. And what these formats are essentially are different ways to compress an image. All right. When you compress an image, you can lose, sometimes actually lose a little bit of detail in the image. And for example, with GIFs, GIFs are compressed by limiting the number of colors that are available. That's why uh, a GIF is less good for a photograph than for a drawing. If you think of a logo, a logo probably only has a few colors in it. Whereas a photograph, you know, if you look at our photograph of the fall image, there's millions of different colors in it. All right? Um, but GIFs do a very good job compressing and making small um, drawings. So with a JPEG, you could use a logo. You could, you could put a logo in a JPEG, but the file size is liable to be bigger. And even with fast internet connection speeds, it's always a consideration how big the files are that you're having the, the user download. OK. So let's put this on the page. Remember, yes? Can you put back the image that did right there? OK, yeah. Image, SRC equals, and it's just the name of the image. Now the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to put an alt attribute which is simply an explanation for people that um, don't have, uh, that they're using screen readers that, that are visually impaired, that sort of tells them what the image is. So, image of, I think it said this was Cincinnati. I don't know how to spell Cincinnati, so I'll say Cincy in fall. Now the image tag is kind of weird. There's, there's, you, you really don't need an ending tag with it, so you indicate that by doing this at the end. This means that this is a starting and ending tag all in one. So now I save this, and I can look at it. And wow. That's a big image, all right? So 
what do you do? Well, we can edit that image and we can make it smaller. Now, I know in Flickr we could have downloaded a smaller image, but let's forget about that for a second. Let's say this is an image that we took on our own and we pulled it off our camera and it's this big. Obviously, we want a smaller version of this image. All right. Couple things about resizing images. Number one, keep, make sure you have a backup of the image in its original size. The reason for that is if you make an image smaller and then try to make it bigger again, you end up distorting the image. All right? And we'll play around with that and, and see an example of that in a minute here. But you can make an image smaller and it will still look clear. It will just be smaller. But if you then take that same image and make it bigger again, you lose detail. So make a backup of the original size of the image and work off the, the backup. And, or work off the, keep the backup safe and then, then go and, and uh, work on uh, the copy of it. Second thing is you want to make sure the aspect ratio is kept consistent. What is the aspect ratio? The aspect ratio is the, the ratio between the height and width of the image. So for example, you could have an image that's square. Let's say it's 400 pixels by 400 pixels. A pixel is a dot on the screen. That's how you measure the size of images. Now, if your original image was this big and you had a smiley face, All right. Smiley face is meant to be a circle. Now, if you resize that and weren't careful, if you made, for example, the height 200 and the width 100, you've changed the aspect ratio. So what you're going to have is you're going to have a really stretched out smiley face like this. Or if you did the reverse, you'd have a really stretched out smiley face this way. So either of those two things are going to distort the image. So you want to keep the ratio of the height and width the same when you resize it. All right? So two rules. Keep a copy of it. Make sure the aspect ratio. Now, how do you edit images? There are all sorts of applications available to, to edit images in. Um, and we have a whole class in multimedia where we spend a unit talking about editing images and, and things like that. Um, it doesn't matter what tool you use. A lot of them have many similar features in them. All right? You can even use something as simple as Microsoft Paint. All right? That's sort of the simplest image editor that you have. Um, other editors, of course, include things like Photoshop, which is a great tool. You can do all sorts of things with images but it's expensive. Another tool that I, I use is called GIMP, which is a free open source application that uh, does most of the things that Photoshop does and has the advantage that it's absolutely free. All right? GIMP, G-I-M-P. Which I believe stands for New Image Manipulation Program. I think. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to open this up. I'm going to open this image. Well, I'm going to make a copy of it first. I'm going to go and open it with. Oh, okay, thank you. I'm going to open it up with, oh, we have GIMP on this machine. So I will do, uh, I'll do one example in Paint and we'll redo it in, in, uh, with GIMP. So I'll open it up in Paint. The one nice thing about Paint, the reason that I show it is any Windows machine is going to have it on it. So you don't have to download or anything, it just comes automatically. Now I can click Resize here. And again, I can resize either by pixels or by percentage. 
When that is checked, it won't allow me to distort the aspect ratio. So if I change one, it automatically changes the other. So for example, if I say I want it to be 25%, it automatically changes vertical at the same time. All right? So maybe that's a good size for our image. So I can go and save it. And now if I look at my page again, well, that looks a lot more reasonable. Now, just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to copy this guy again. And I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to do something extremely bad. I'm going to make this real small. I'm going to resize it, and I'm going to make it 5%. But I make it tiny and save it. Now if I go back in again, and I say, oh, that's too small. I want to make it bigger. So I'll make it 500% bigger. Notice how the image is blurry. All right? Because again, when you make it smaller, you're actually losing information. You're compressing, you're getting rid of, of detail. So if you take that less detailed image and try to make it bigger, you're going to end up losing data. All right? And it's going to be blurry. Things like they're uh, uh, straight, they appear like curved, will appear like jagged lines. All right? That's called pixelization. You can sort of see that with the tree trunk here. Let me go and make it bigger still. Notice how the tree trunk doesn't look like a um, doesn't look like a curve like it did in the original. It sort of looks like a staircase going up. Now GIMP, one thing I don't like about it is it takes a little while to load this program, but once you do it, you have a lot of pretty easy capabilities, pretty, pretty good capabilities. So we'll let this load for a while. It even warns you, it says down here, this may take a while. Usually this happens the first time that you open it up. Um, subsequent times usually go a little quicker. I'm going to let this go and we'll come back to this. Are there any questions about this? All right, let's go and let's try to put some style on this. Okay, let's go and try to put some style on this. Now, I'm going to go and I'm going to create a new style sheet file. So I click New. And I'm going to say Body. Background. I'm going to pick a nice fall color. So, HTML color scheme generator. I think that would be a nice fall palette. So I'm going to make the background of the page this, which is 
FF, B2, 7, 3. So now I'm going to go save this on the desktop as a CSS file. And I'm going to call it style.css. Actually, I'm going to call it main.css. Now, I have to link it to this page. I have to tell this page, hey, use that style sheet file. The reason I put it in its own file is so that I can link this on many pages. So I can use many pages, all of which use the same file. So I will go here and I will say link type equals text slash CSS rel equals style sheet. href equals the name of my style sheet file. So I'll save that and view my page. Oh, I changed my mind at the last minute and called it main.css. And there we go. All right. Can you repeat that, please? Exactly. So all you have to do is you would have you would have this line on every page, this link. All right. And again, the advantage of that is then you could just, by making one change, you could change everything in your entire site. So it doesn't matter how many pages you have. That really increases the maintainability. Now the next thing I like to do is I would like to put a background image. All right, a background image is where an image sort of sits over top of, or sits underneath the text on, on a page. So let's go and let's put what could we put? Let's change it so that there is a, oh, I don't know, a background page of, a background of a pumpkin for this page. So, I'm going to use Google Advanced Search. Under images, and I can also search by license in Google if I use the advanced search. So I'm going to use this, again, it's looking for Creative Commons license, and do my advanced search, and I'm going to use this as my background image, or let's see, which one do we want? Let me use this one. That's a nice fall picture. I'm going to click view image. I'm going to save this image as BG for background. I'm going to copy this. I'm going to put it in my Credits, background, from, I can tell by the color coding that something's wrong. And I'll bet I forgot the quote up here. 
All right. Now, how do you make something a background image? Well, under background, instead of specifying a color, you can specify a URL. You can actually specify both, and we'll leave that until next time. But I can say URL, and then in quotes, in parentheses rather, in quotes, I can say bg.jpg. I'll save it. And now when I look at my page, I get this. Now, we can see some problems already with doing this. Kind of looks good, all right? I don't know, now that we have that image there, kind of the background image kind of interferes with it. I don't know, maybe we'd want to get rid of that image or, or do something, maybe put a border around it or something like that. All right. But probably the more glaring issue is that um, the, um, the text is a little hard to read. Like if you notice, there's darker spots of the image, like up here the shadows, and where the text is in that image, it's hard to read. There's a couple ways around that. We could make a text color that we would hope would show up better than black. All right? We could try, we could try white, we could try whatever. The other thing we could do is we could use image editing to alter the image, to maybe wash it out a little bit, to sort of give it a watermark look. And that's one thing that we could... Um, um, do um, in the GIMP or whatever. Um, we'll leave that for next time though, all right, um, of going in and um, um, editing the image or playing with the colors or whatever uh, to get it to work, all right. thing that you want to keep in mind is you do want your pages to look good, but your pages do need to be usable too. All right, so you could have the most beautiful background image out there and your, your page looks really smashing, but um, if, uh, if the page then is rendered unreadable, then you really didn't do any good. All right, so we'll look at some ways that we can fix this. All right, are there any questions? All right, um, we'll see you up in lab.